Good morning, everybody. Nice to meet you guys. My name is Graham Chukumobi. Um, that's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm not, uh, I think I've barely been on Facebook for a while, so that's why I didn't bother putting that, but yeah, you can find me on Facebook with my name and on Instagram. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about my journey to cloud native, Kubernetes, and trying to secure it. So this talk is, you know, I'll say for the newbies, people trying to delve, you know, into the whole cloud native bandwagon, the ecosystem, and then just to give you like a route on how to go about learning these technologies. So for me, it all started, you know, with a workshop um, when I was still in uni during my final year studying software engineering at Cardiff Met. So, and I think it was six of my friends. We had like a friend group where we try, you know, to attend as much workshops and seminars as possible, you know, possibly ones that will give us some badge to add to our LinkedIn profile to help us with our job search and job hunt. So that was how we came across, you know, the Kubernetes workshops and, you know, we all jumped on it. <coughs> and then, you know, it was, I'll say it was a good experience. Then, even though, you know, everything was so vague and, you know, so alien to us at the, at the time. So, but the instructor did a very good job, you know, starting to explain, um, give us an overview about the different architecture um, the monolithic architecture and the microservice architecture. So for me at the time, I got to, you know, understand that, oh, all this while I've been developing, you know, using the monolithic architecture without even now knowing about it, you know, went on after the research to, after the workshop to do my own research to really get to understand these um, different architectures. So, you know, for me, I, did, um, I was like, if, we've been developing using this architecture and everything has been working fine. So why the need for the whole microservices and Kubernetes, because everything sounded so difficult. So I'm just going to touch on some of the um, advantages of monolithic architecture and you know the disadvantages and then we'll move from there. So I guess one of the key advantages of um, the monolithic architecture would be that you know, it's very easy to develop you know, you could develop an entire application and get it to market, you know, very quickly compared to uh, microservices. It's very easy f um, for a team to um, pull together and build an executable app using this architecture. And then it's also simple to deploy. It's not as complex as your microservice um, technology. Multi -applica um, applications have fewer parts, so, so there are fewer components to manage and to fix. And you know, all in all, everything is self-contained in, and it makes it easier to deploy your application. Sorry. And then um, uncomplicated testing and debugging. Testing and debugging is you know, a very big part of the debate of monolithic architectures versus the microservice um, architecture debate. You have to test all the parts of an application um, of an application separately in regards to um, your microservices. You have to test that they work properly and also test that e um, each service fits together and communicates properly. And then you also have the case of um, um, cache caching dependencies and data access. Forgive my pronunciation, English is not my first language. So, you know, that, um, uh, but with regards to monolithic architecture, these, these um, are not the case because the application is fitted as a single unit and works together as a whole. You can, you know, do everything quickly and easily from a central logging system. But it also has its own disadvantage in the sense that um, you, it's less scalable. So with the monolithic architecture, because the software is tightly coupled, you know, it can be very difficult to like scale the software. For, for instance, if you wanted to like um, advance a particular feature or um, part of your application, you literally have to take down, you know, the whole application just to alter a single feature. It's difficult to adapt to new technology. Um, as mentioned, it, um, it's, it's a tightly coupled architecture. So, if, for instance, you take a, a music application, for example, where the, you have your catalog is tightly coupled to like the purchase and the, the play services, 
if you wanted to like um, just maybe um, alter the features of the catalog or the play purchase, like I said earlier, you still have to like, you know, take the whole application down just to be able to alter that feature. And then there is very high dependencies between the functionalities of um, the um, monolithic architecture. So um, applications can run into software engineering downtime and difficulties. If you go um, back to the music app, for example, because the catalog and the play and the purchase function are so dependent upon each other, well, uh, um, again, if you know, one, one of them should go down, the whole application will be affected. So, but in um, with regards to the microservice architecture, which is you know basically a style of um, large application built as a collection of small, um, independently deployable services, as you can see, you know, in with this example. So these services communicate with each other through APIs and are designed to be loosely coupled, you know, so that they can be developed and tested and deployed independently. Um, Microservice architecture also enables faster development and scalability and makes it easier to evolve and maintain your application over time because, you know, like, as you can see with the different services, each service can be developed or, you know, uh, managed by a different team and they can make use of what that, whatever technology that they are very comfortable with. And then, you know, it also has its cause, comes with its own pros and cons. You know, um, with regards to microservices, it's very scalable, it's easier to scale. Each microservice can be scaled individually, leading to um, better resource utilization and improved performance. It's very resilient. In, if one microservice fails, it doesn't bring down the entire system. Um, the other parts, you know, keep functioning as um, intended. It, it improves the um, deployment of your application. Microservice can be deployed independently, you know, allowing for um, faster and more frequent release. It's flexible, allows for greater flexibility in choosing technology stacks. So like I said earlier, each of um, the services can be um, created using whatever um, technology stacks that the team or the developer is comfortable with. But it also has its own disadvantages, you know, which includes complexity. Microservice architecture adds, you know, complexity in terms of communicating and testing and deployment. Um, dependency management between the microservices need to be managed carefully to avoid errors and delays. Um, it also, you know, comes with the issue of network latency. Increased network calls between these services can lead to slower performance. And um, debugging is also more complex um, in microservices, which and, and environment issues can span between multiple services. And also testing micro, a microservice in an application can be more demanding. You know, you have to test the individual service on, on their own and also test that they communicate with each other as intended. So when stacked up together side by side, you start to understand, you know, why microservice started becoming, you know, more popular. Uh, for me, you know, being, I'll say, relatively new within the industry, I can't really tell how far, you know, back, you know, we could go with microservices. But um, in some monolithic application is built as a single unified unit. While you know microservices is a collection of smaller independently deployable um, services. So in the case of um, the example we gave above, for instance, if you wanted to go about you know um, program or developing such service, you're going to have like um, your REST API CRUD for the account DB or the user DB, whatever case it may be. You know programmed like in this case, I just you know try to. Um, sketch or like call it a draft um, code for you know the account DB using fast API. You also have your REST API CRUD for the event inventory um, REST API and then for the um, shipping too. So um, as you can see here in the um, um, project directory, all the different um, service or um, REST API are in their own directory. This is just to show you know, that this service can be developed by a different team on its own and, you know, be a full-fledged application on its own, you know, but as long as, like, um, the design or 
the requirements for the application is followed and then the APIs are able to communicate with each other, both on in dev and in prod. So as you can see for each service um, in its own directory, it has its own requirements, .txt file, its own Docker file, um, but in this case, you also have um, your Docker file for the whole application and your Docker Compose file. I'll you know, go into explaining those down the slide. So where does Cloud Native come you know, into this whole picture? Um, Cloud Native, uh, um, um, first of all, is an approach of building and running applications and services that take advantage of the features and capabilities of cloud computing platforms. Um, the cloud native approach focuses on using um, some of the following principles we've mentioned already, like your microservices and then and some other features like containers, like, which is basically packaging applications and their dependencies into lightweight um, portable containers, which can run consistently across different environments. Um, cloud native also focuses on automation um, automating the deployment, scaling, and management of applications and services, um, observ observability, sorry, monitoring and collecting data from applications and services to gain insights um, about their behaviors and performance. And also, it also encourages resilience, um, designing applications to be highly available and withstand um, failure issues. So, but before we go into details with um, container, containerization of application, I would just like to like um, touch on, I will not really go into full details, but just, you know, um, so you can see the difference between VM, virtual machines and containerization, because VMs was the solution before um, containerization became a, a thing. So VMs um, is basically a software implementation of a physical machine, which allows multiple operating systems to run on a single host. Each VM runs um, on its own operating system, which provides an, an isolated environment for your application to run, while a container is a lightweight um, standalone executable package that contains everything an application needs to run, including your code, your runtime, your system tools, your libraries, and your settings. Containers uses the host operating system kernel, which makes them more lightweight and efficient than VMs. So in summary, VMs, a VM is a full-fledged virtualized environment, while your container is a lightweight isolated environment that just shares um, the host um, kernel's operating system. So in, in this case, um, from our example uh, microservice um, application, you see that each of the service, um, it's on its own um, separate container, specified by the black rectangle. So containerization has really become um, a popular approach for packaging and deploying applications in recent years. It offers several benefits like um, portability. Containers can run on any system as long as that system supports containerization technology. It makes it um, very easy to move application between different environments, such as from development to production. Containers um, support isolation. They provide um, a level of isolation for applications, which means that they are isolated from each other and from the host system. This reduces the risk of conflict between different applications and their dependencies. It's very resource efficient. Containers are lightweight and share the host operating systems kernel, which makes them more resource efficient than um, in the case of virtual machines. They are very scalable. They can easily be scaled up and down to meet changing demands. Um, it can be version controlled. Container image can be versioned and stored in a container registry, and you can easily roll back to a previous version. And um, with all these things um, um, about um, containers and the features they bring to the table, like the scaling up and down you know, of your containers depend, um, depending on the changing, um, change of demand, you know, um, how do we go about implementing all these things and um, making sure that you know, everything works as intended, we can scale up and down you know, as required? This really is where, as you must have guessed, you know, Kubernetes um, comes in. So Kubernetes, which is often called KS for, for, um, in short, is um, 
a container orchestration system for automating the um, deployment, scaling, and management of containerized application. I hope I'm not far beyond time. I think I started the slide too early, so my time, I think, is wrong. So um, it was originally developed by Google and is now maintained by um, cloud native CNCF. Kubernetes provides um, a platform agnostic way to manage and orchestrate containers, allowing developers to focus on writing codes instead of managing infrastructure. It also provides um, um, some of the following features like automatic bin packing, um, or you automatically schedule containers to run on the most appropriate nodes available. Um, it, it provides self-healing um, capabilities. Containers can automatically detect and replace field, um, sorry, Kubernetes can automatically detect and replace field containers. Um, it provides serv service discovery and load balancing capabilities. It, um, it has a built-in service discovery mechanism which allows containers to automatically discover and communicate with each other. It also provides load balancing capabilities that automatically distributes traffic amongst multiple replicas of a container. Um, it has um, the automated rollout and rollback features that allows for automated rollbacks of ro rollouts of new versions of, of an application, which makes it easy to update applications without downtime. It also has the secret um, and configuration management features that allows, to, f that allows for the secure storage of um, your secret passwords and uh, encryption keys. There are also um, um, other popular choice for container orchestration, but Kubernetes is the most popular one and is widely used in, in production environments, both on-prem and in cloud, and can be used you know, with other um, um, technology, cloud native technologies like Docker and Prometheus. So for me at the time, you know, um, with this whole knowledge, you know, from the workshop and from personal research, it was back to, you know, um, usual for me. But luckily, um, I started um, studying my master's, which was in cybersecurity, and it was a two years program. So we had the option of doing our third, I think it was the third semester, you either research on a topic or you go for an internship. So I, I, get, I, I went for an internship and I was lucky enough, I got three offers, two for software engineering, then one for a cloud native Dev, DevSecOps internship. And as you'd have guessed, I went for it. So um, for, um, it was really an opportunity for me to really get um, hands-on experience with um, cloud native technologies like Kubernetes and Docker, and you know, really delve into it big time. I, I, and I mean, it's been, you know, for me, um, cloud native since then. And um, armed with the luxury of experienced colleagues, you know, during my internship, I was able to ask them the best approach and best route or the best way to go about learning these tools. And most of them, you know, we are like of the opinion of getting comfortable with the Linux system um, first, then delving into containers, and then eventually Kubernetes. So, yeah, I brushed up on my Linux, you know, abilities because I've always been a Windows guy. And then um, after that, you know, I, went, I delved um, head deep into containers. I was able to really understand containers, how to create container from writing your Docker file for your application and then creating a Docker um, image, a container image from your Docker file using the Docker build command and then eventually um, a Docker container with the Docker run command got to understand how to pull and push container images to um, container registries. And you know, um, after that, I, I, I guess one of, um, I also, I would say some of the resources I used to really get um, hands on with um, containers, Linux, where you know, um, the, I think the main one was the upscale, 20 day upscale um, 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 channel on Reddit, and then some YouTube resources, and then after you know, getting to understand Docker images, how to create mine, and how to make use of um, images already available on container registry. This is just an example of a Docker file. Um, and then really understanding the specifications for building containers, you know, how to um, make use of like CI, um, CIS benchmarks or just really understanding your application to create, you know, to be able to write um, a Docker file that is going to 
really um, run your um, application properly the way you want it, or sometimes just following you know, an inter internal specification depending on the organization you're working for. So, you know, I was really, um, I would say, very comfortable with container at the time and then um, went um, on to really understand Kubernetes. So, um, I was for, um, this is just um, a basic overview of the features or, or architecture of um, Kubernetes. So, um, some of the features, like you can see here, the master node, which is the node, <coughs> the, um, the master node is the control plane node of a Kubernetes cluster. It's responsible for maintaining the desired states and ensuring that the actual state matches the desired state. You have your worker nodes. The worker nodes are the um, machines that run your containerized applications and, <coughs> and they communicate to the master node to receive instruction on what to run and how to run it. Each, each worker um, node runs a container runtime, such as Docker, Kubelet, and it communicates with the master node and ensures that the desired state um, of the cluster is always maintained. Then you have your Kube um, API server, um, which is um, the key component, one of the key components of the Kubernetes control plane that exposes some RESTful API endpoints. I think um, you can see them there that can be used to perform various operations on the cluster, including some CRUD operations on resources such as pods, services, deployment. It communicates with the etcd data store to retrieve and update the states of the cluster, and it communicates with the um, kubelets on each worker node to ensure that the um, actual state of the cluster matches the desired state. You also have your um, Kube, um, Kubernetes controller manager which is a component that runs as part of the Kubernetes control plane. It is responsible for running various um, controllers, like your replication controller, your endpoint controller, namespace controller, service and token controllers. These controllers are responsible for maintaining the desired state of the um, cluster. For example, ensuring that the um, number of replica pods um, desired is running uh, on the cluster. You also have your Kubernetes scheduler, which is a component that runs as part of your Kubernetes control plane. It's also responsible for scheduling pods on worker nodes in the cluster. The scheduler receives specifications from the Kube um, API server and assigns, assigns them to you know, the appropriate worker nodes based on various factors, such as available resources, constraints, and affinity rules. You have your um, Kubernetes kubelet, which is a lightweight agent that runs on each worker node in a Kubernetes cluster. It's responsible for ensuring that the desired state of the cluster is reflected on the nodes it runs on. And then you have your Kubernetes proxy, um, which is a component that runs on each worker nodes of the, um, your Kubernetes cluster and is responsible for maintaining the network rules, rules on the node and for forwarding traffic to the correct pods. Then your etcd, your etcd is a distributed key store that is used by Kubernetes as a um, backing store for all, its, um, for all its cluster data. It stores the configuration data for the Kubernetes control plane and all objects in the cluster. You also have your container engine, which is the, um, the software responsible for managing the life cycles of containers, including you know, starting, stopping, and managing the, um, the resources of the containers. Um, there are so many other um, resources of the Kubernetes, including like your pods, your um, deployment stateful sets, and daemon sets, but um, these are just a few um, of them. Then in, in our case, we, are, you know, we try to um, sketch or to build up on the example REST API. Um, if you were working on, like, like I said, you know, for the newbies, people who are trying to really you know, get um, accustomed with these technologies. So in a situation where you're creating um, a microservice like that and you wanted to test them, you, know, you can make use of um, the Docker Compose, which is a tool for defining and running multiple container, um, um, container or Docker applications. It allows you to define the service that makes up your application you know, in a single Docker Compose file, and then you can start, start them and manage them. Like in our case, I, I don't know if you can see it, you see we have the um, user um, service, the shipping service, and the inventory um, service. In this case, they've all been converted to a Docker image, um, the inventory image, user image, and shipping image. And then we also have a network, 
you know, for, to ensure that all the services are running within the same network and we have our database there. So you can use um, a Docker Compose file to test your application, or you could just write your own um, Kubernetes deployment um, configuration file. Um, using, um, a Kuben using Kubernetes to deploy, um, and you can use a Kubernetes deployment configuration file to deploy and scale your application. This, um, in this process, you just write your deployment configuration, which defines the desired state of the application, the resources um, it needs to run, and then using the Kubernetes command line, or the, or the API, you create and manage your deployment. The, the, the configuration can include information such as the number of replicas, how many replicas you want the container to be, um, and then the resource limits and your environment variables um, to run your services. You could also use um, the Kubernetes um, stateful set um, um, resource. Um, this is used to manage deployments, um, just like your deployment file, or, but in this case, for stateful applications, a stateful application is an application that you know it requires a host name and a persistent storage, like um, your database, for example. So, um, um, and unlike deployments, which uses replication controller and replica sets to manage the scaling and availability of state, stateless pods, a stateful set uses a unique host name for each pod and guarantees that the pod, that pods are created and deleted in a specific order. This ensures that the pod maintain the same network identity throughout their life cycles, allowing them to maintain stable network connections. And stateful sets also provides a way to provision persistent storage for pods. So, you know, this is also an example of a stateful set configuration file. It's just like the, um, the deployments file, but in this case, this is um, more suited for um, pods or containers, you know, that require persistent storage. So, um, and then um, down, you know, the configuration file, you see where um, a service, a configuration for a service is um, specified. It, like I said, like um, um, I stated in our Docker Compose example, this to ensure that your containers and pods, you know, run within the same network. So, Armed with this um, information, you know, with um, so far, you're well, you know, on your way to being able to sit for the CKS certification. And then, you know, like I said, this is basically um, Johnny's Cloud Native Kubernetes and how to secure it. So where does security come into all this? But I would like to also point out that security shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be something you also think about, you know, um, in the process of implementing and designing um, your application. But f um, for me as a newbie, um, one, one of the um, very important um, place to start with with regards to security is your requirement.txt file. This is where you, you know, I will say keep track or record of all the libraries, plugins, and in third party um, softwares or whatever you must have used in, your, in the um, production or development of your application, like in this case, um, using the fast API um, framework, um, we use the Python Python 3.4 Alpine, the um, fast API, and then the UVCon server. So, um, armed with this information, you could easily, you know, maybe go to the documentations or research on. Um, um, the zero day um, vulnerabilities um, announcement, you know, up security updates and patches. But, you know, um, something, another thing you could do is um, scan um, this image using some open source and freely available image scanners. Like um, you have your Aqua V, for example, which is what I, I like, I use regularly. So after creating your own Docker, writing your own Docker file and creating a container image from it, you could easily scan your own container image or scan any of this. Like in this case, we scanned um, the Python, um, the, um, the, like call it the Python library or the Python software itself. Um, so, and then the, the good thing about Aqua V is that it, 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 not, it jo doesn't just give you the vulnerability report, but it also gives you the installed version of you know, whatever vulnerability um, it finds in your container image, it gives you the installed version of that library or plugin or whatever it is, and then the 
fixed version of it. So armed with this information, all you have to do is to go to the documentation of that library or plugin, you know, look for the fixed version, download it and implement it in your application. But, you know, just to uh, put it out there, when you scan your container image and you don't get a report, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, um, your um, app or um, product is completely secure. It just means that at the time of scanning, no vulnerability or um, security issue has been reported because the way Aqua Trivi works is by it scans your, your container image, checks all the libraries and plugins and third party um, softwares you're using, and then scans this, um, goes through the CV database to know if anything has been reported on those. So if anything has been reported, it throws it back, back at you and gives you the results and um, the, um, um, the, um, the it tells you if it's um, a critical vulnerability, a medium one or a low one, but whichever one it is, it's always good to implement the patch immediately. And then some additional tips for security is to, you know, <coughs> always um, use security monitoring and logging tools to, you know, quickly detect and respond to security threats. It's always um, it make it um, a duty to always keep your softwares and systems up to date you know, with latest security patches and updates, this will, always, this will ensure that your cloud resources are protected against known vulnerabilities. Um, use a cloud native security solution such as Service Mesh. This can provide um, security features like service to service authentication and encryption. Make use of role um, based access control to limit access to the cluster to only authorize users and roles. Use um, Kubernetes security context to limit the capabilities of your pods and your containers running in the cluster. This will help to protect the cluster and its resources from malicious or misconfigured containers. Make use of Kubernetes network policies to control traffic between your pods and use of um, and make use of Kubernetes security policies to control pod and container security settings. Always use secrets and config maps to securely store and manage sensitive data like password and encryption keys. Use Kubernetes audit login to track and monitor activities within your cluster. Use third party security solutions. Sorry, I know this is more of like use, use, use. Use third party security solutions um, as Kubernetes network and pod um, security solutions to provide additional security features and um, protections. This can be helpful in providing extra security layers to detect and prevent vulnerability. Um, like I said earlier, always um, update and patch your Kubernetes cluster. Or seek help from um, experienced and professional and professionals or consult you know, your, um, some online resources, especially um, the official documentations of whatever um, third party security software you're using or libraries and plugin. And then always be vigilant about new security threats, threats and best practices to keep your cloud environments um, um, safe. One other um, tip I'd like to add there is to always link um, your codes, especially your Docker file code to make sure you're following um, industry standard. In the, in, in the case of Dockerfile, for example, you can make use of the Hado lint, um, lint, linter. I, um, you, you, don't, you don't really need to install it. You can just go to, the, to their website or their documentation page, copy your, um, Docker, your codes or your Dockerfile, paste it there, and then it gives you, you know, um, corrections to make, um, how to implement your path, and you know the base images to um, how to specify your base images or your commands that helps a lot and then um, I guess that's it so but feel free if you have any question or uh, anything you'd like to know and resources are used like the code cloud resource and um, Moonshap tutorial feel free to reach out and um, I don't mind sharing those yeah thank you